The barbarian reaches for his weapon. He draws his trusty axe and swings it menacingly. As he swings, the axe breaks into song? And as he cleaves the head from his foes, you hear, You can dance if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. Would you, you too, like an item smarter than its wielder? Then tonight, join us as we explore like intelligent water. objects. You can act like an imbecile. That's how we roll. 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 That's how we Welcome to the Goblin's Corner. My name is Eric. And I'm Matt. And tonight... We're talking about intelligent objects. That's right. We have a delightful show for you this evening because we're going to talk about some magic objects. You see a lot of the sword in the stone type of enchanted weapons that are intelligent. Yeah, we don't care about that. Let's talk about some really interesting objects that aren't weapons tonight. And yeah. we've got, what, six examples? Sure, like and we do. some rules on how to create them for yourself. Indeed. So let's dive into the mix. So before we jump into all of this, if you haven't yet, please hit the like and subscribe button. It helps us get our show out to more people and get notified when more amazing episodes come your way. And if you're listening to the show, drop us a review on iTunes or Podchaser. We'd appreciate it. Yeah, it'd help us out, right? Yep. So tonight, why are we talking about intelligent objects, Matt? Like we prefer. They provide fun stories for players to develop. Yes. And... The players should be free to develop the stories, not necessarily the other way around. Absolutely. This is something we say a lot, like build the stories with your players, build them with a goal in mind, and intelligent objects are a great way to do this. They may not want to have a super copacetic relationship with their intelligent object. I wouldn't. I mean, (laughs) you're wearing it. I mean, imagine having a tie that talks to you. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of ties, so we're automatically going to start on rocky ground. It's already ground. stuck up yeah. because it's a tie. It wants you to get a job or something. <laughs> Come on. How dare you? So that's a lot of fun to play up that type of relationship, right? Uh, the lore is very important when it comes to intelligent objects. They should provide lore to your game world. They also make for great NPCs or even villains. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of stories in fantasy already about an evil sword which takes control of the mind of its wielder. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, the dragon spheres from Dragonlands. The god Sirik and his dagger. Yeah. All kinds of different things, right? These are also helpful in terms of DM fiats. And what do we mean by DM fiats, Matt? You can provide things like clues in a dungeon or assisting with a skill or a social encounter based off of what this object knows it is smart yes so if you have a party of people who are new or even a party of experienced adventurers and maybe they're not savvy on a particular element like say puzzles in a dungeon sure an intelligent object makes a great npc that just every now and then speaks up and provides just a little bit of like oomph to the game a little bit of dramatic element or comedy or just helps them get through this puzzle so you can get to the important stuff like slaying monsters sure And finally, intelligent objects are just plain out awesome. Yeah, they're fun. They're fun, and we feel they don't get enough love. So why not make anything intelligent, not just weapons? Yeah, and we're going to talk about some of those very soon. But first, we got to talk about rules. All right. So these rules are standard magic item rules that we have built over time, but also we got a couple extra ones because these are intelligent objects. So what's the first, Matt? These should be story options. Not MacGuffins. Yes. Intelligent objects are, in many ways, NPCs. They should have story hooks where they're appropriate. And story hooks are important. You should have a reason for introducing this object into your world, right? The lore behind them makes them far more interesting if it has a story than if you just say this magical booze barrel appears in your tavern, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Talks like your granddad for some reason. I don't know why, but it does. Pours you a great ca- keg of ale, but the whole time it's talking about young whippersnappers and how they, uh, they're they all a bunch of oak barrels and you were a <laughs> pine barrel or something like that. Sure. Pine barrel oak. I don't even know if that exists. No, but I don't, it doesn't. Okay. I know nothing about brewing. Yeah. So think about that. Yeah. The thing is, is like, okay, if you've got a plus two weapon, mm-hmm. that's that's useful. That's cool. But if you have a plus two weapon that is constantly critiquing your outfits or (laughs) 
Right, because it was a fop in its former life. How uncouth you are, trudging through the mud. My God, Paladin, you must shine your armor more lest you drown beneath the swamp. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome and fun. Yeah, exactly. And irritating to the players, which is also hilarious for you. If it's an everyday object, it should have some sort of distinct descriptor and maybe a quirk should be included. Now, for us personally, we like quirks. <laughs> yes. Quirks are great. And intelligent objects basically always have one of some sort. Yes. We consider them to, in our game essential. Yes. There should be a reason behind providing this object to your players. So, for example, it's an object. We're not talking about weapons here. Weapons have one purpose to kill people. Right. So this is an object. Is it a pen? If it's a hammer, whatever it happens to be, right? A book? Sure. What's its function? It was made specifically for a purpose. And so define that purpose, not only for yourself, but also to your players, because that influences its behavior. Sure. Where appropriate, it should be amusing. Yes. Humor is how intelligent beings deal with all manner of things. And this object is an intelligent being. Straight up? Yeah. So give it some thoughts. Specifically, some rules on intelligent objects as well. And these, what I would be considered an addendum to what we normally say. First off, they are intelligent objects. They're right. not dumb. They are capable of thought, emotions, and opinions. Depending upon how intelligent, they can also do things like make plans or form long-term objectives. Play them out like an NPC. Sure. This makes them, A, a lot more fun to play, and B, it gives them a lot more depth to your world. Intelligent objects have an actual personality, and this should be key in creating the object as it fits with its abilities, its motivations, and as, we, as you mentioned, right, like long-term motivations and long-term goals. Yeah. So if I am a pin... Mm -hmm and my function is to write things, Sure. then my personality quirk might be if someone's erasing works of art or tearing up books, I might find that abhorrent. I must be forced to murder that I person. I must be forced to turn into a sword and <laughs> slay you. Or zip around like the thing from Guardians of the Galaxy, the, sure. the arrow. Yeah. That would be pretty cool, right? What if it's the uh, pen of an author that died before they finished their great work and now they're looking for a co-author? Oh, that would be amazing. Right? Like that that not only is a lore, that's also potentially a side quest. Sure. So I love that as well. Uh moving on to this in terms of motivations and stuff like that, intelligent objects all want something. What is it? What do they want? Does this tie in with their purpose, as we mentioned, like the reason it was made? Or does it conflict with their purpose? And that might also be fun, like a an intelligent book that wants all the other books in the world to burn. <laughs> sure. That would be awesome. Or maybe it contains lore that was not meant to be seen by mortal eyes, and so it wants itself erased from history, but it can't be destroyed. A cleric of peace that was tied into a very powerful weapon. That's oh, just, that's just rude. It's so rude. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love Yeah, that would be hilarious. Or even worse, a, cl uh, a cleric of vengeance that was turned into a pillow. <laughs> I am the great warlord, the cleric of Tempus. All have been slain before me for countless years. Now I'm a pillow. Sure. Just goes around trying to beat people to death with its pillow, smothering them. Ty, like a uh, guard, like famous for never missing what was going on into like a hammock. Yeah, just hangs out. Yeah, it's some, some place where somebody naps. It definitely is, you know, in conflict with its purpose, right? It doesn't have to be a weapon. And in fact, this entire episode is about objects which are not weapons. Right. In fact, I find it more amusing when they're not weapons. Don't get me wrong. I love intelligent weapons. But I don't like the fact that almost nothing else is intelligent. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. It also doesn't have to be powerful or world shattering. It can just be intelligent. Sure. Could be a soup spoon that talks to you while you eat. How's that gruel, buddy? Does it taste pretty good? Yeah, you like that? How's that working out for you? It was <laughs> that's kind of creepy spoon to be doing it that. Is. But it was it was a cook that some necromancer loved his food, and he was like, mm, "I'm not letting this dude die." Nope. Yep. You're coming with me, pal. 
into the afterlife he goes, now resurrected as a spoon. All right, and that's it. Have fun with these objects. Speaking of which, we have six amazing objects for you this evening. And the first, Matt, you've titled Elbert. Yes. And before we get to that, we've got description, personality, powers, and some lore. Yeah. And we added personality specifically for this show because all of these are going to have a specific personality behind them. So tell me about what the hell Elbert is. Elbert is a large terracotta flower pot. Now, any magic that pierces illusion will show that this pot is made of a solid piece of jade. So it's a peaceful piece of jade pottery. Yes. Try saying that three times fast. Nope. Tell me if it's personality. <laughs> All right. It's a kind but crotchety old groundskeeper. Basically, he just wants to be placed somewhere where he can create an elegant garden oasis. That sounds delightful. Yeah. He just, he's an old groundskeeper. Okay. So we've got this pot that's a groundskeeper wants to be just chilling someplace where there's a lot of trees yep. or flowers or whatnot yeah what are its powers does it have any yes it can possess and animate whatever plant is planted in the pot it can awaken a plant twice a year that's kind of cool it is knowledgeable in herbalism nature and alchemy that applies to either plants or pests as as you would be if you were a groundskeeper, a groundskeeper yeah the pot is medium-sized and can contain a medium-sized plant. Now, Elbert prefers willows due to the flexibility and reach of the limbs. Let me guess. It animates this uh, whatever you plant in it? Yeah. That's kind of cool. It possesses it and then animates it and then walks around and, and gardens. So does the uh, pot itself talk or does the animated plant talk? Both. Uh, if there's a plant not in the pot, then the pot can talk, but it prefers to use basically the treant body it makes for itself. Can you imagine this new groundskeeper that shows up on this residence, starts planting stuff, planting some shrubs, and all of a sudden, like, the pot just starts talking to him, <laughs> and he's looking at this terracotta pot, doesn't realize it's jade, because he's not a wizard. Sure. He's like, what the hell's up with this pot? You can't be planting that in this type of soil. Don't you understand zones, boy? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then it animates a tree and slays him. It beats him to death with the branches. Those roses will die in the shade there. They're bound to get fungus. Not anymore. You just slayed the greenskeeper. <laughs> Grow great tomatoes. Tell me the lore of Elbert. It's pretty simple. Elbert was a groundskeeper for an archmage long ago. Both he and the mage were perfectionists, and the archmage being longer lived than Elbert decided that uh, as Elbert was getting on in years, he was going to lock his spirit into this jade pot so that he could stay behind and continue to garden. Eventually, things happened, and uh, the Archimage died, the tower fell to ruin, and Elbert continued to maintain the area. But he's, he's not a stone worker or anything like that, so eventually the tower fell, and he was just like, hmm. Might be time to move on. <laughs> what a cool story this would be, though. Like, the party's traveling through the woods, and the woods might have been a thousand years ago just a well-tended topiary garden or something like that. And so the druid, as he's walking through, looks around and goes, huh, you know, these are all shrubs, like some kind of shrub. This isn't native to this part of the world. And then they stumble upon the plant yeah, that animates and slays the paladin, buries him in the ground, grows great tomatoes. <laughs> I was I was literally <laughs> thinking that is if I were to use this that is how I would introduce it is you're you're walking through a forest or what have you and you come across just an elegant garden out of nowhere it's all wild yep or maybe tended maybe Elbert's still there just hanging out yeah what an awesome intelligent object now you have Brambleton's Bard book yes i have an intelligent book Okay. And it is a bard's book, as you might have guessed by the title. Uh, the description is as follows. This rich, red-leathered, bound book has gold-leafed pages and a somewhat stained brass book cover. Okay. So the corners. Right. Embossed on the thick cover is a halfling's mouth and nose, complete with teeth and so forth. So it's a halfling's face, sans the eye, no eyes. It's a, it's a little necronomicon -ish. A little necronomicon -ish, right? And where the eye is, is a random musical instrument to be determined by whatever, right? Uh, I was thinking it would be kind of cool is the last person to own Brambleton's Bard book, whatever they played, 
would be the eye of the uh, book. So oh, if I was they thinking loop, maybe it changed on occasion. Or it could just randomly change. I'm fine with that as well. While B3, as it likes to be called, has seen some use, it overall appears very sturdy and can hold quite a number of pages. Okay. So it's a big leather brown book. What is the personality of this thing? Brambleton's bard book is arrogant, flamboyant, and a music erudite, believing itself and by association its owner superior to all other creatures in the performing arts. It's a ham. Sure. Right? It will not allow itself to be owned by any creatures which are not musically inclined, and if it is, it will lose itself at the first convenient moment. I love that. It'll lose itself. It'll just randomly fall out of somebody's sack, flap away maybe. That'd be kind of fun too. Sure. Additionally, B3 constantly urges its owner to greatness, be it through performance in the music arts, mm -hmm. heroic deeds, or daring conquest, whether the owner wants it to or not. It will goad you into doing stuff. Sure. <laughs> it is not, for example, verbally above taunting a monster into attacking so that the owner will defeat it and thus enhance their reputation. I love this. Absolutely. This is totally a Bard's book, right? Yeah. Can you imagine you're wandering through the woods, you've got this book in your hand that you found, and this monster comes out. Let's say a couple of ogres, right? Just some ogres. You're a low-level party. Sure. And the book starts taunting the ogres into attacking, and you're like, shut up! The ogres attack. Ha-ha! I'm glad you defeated them. Now our reputation will precede us. Be awesome. What, what powers does this thing have other than... Taunting. Being, other than being an asshole? Yeah. If the owner of Brambleton's Bard book is a bard, they can cast, say, once per day, uh, any first level spell or lower off the bard list. You just get to pick a random spell. Nice. Additionally, B3 is a flawless map maker and lore keeper and will eagerly chronicle the character's journeys through an adventure, provided the adventure is exciting and interesting. If the adventure is not exciting and interesting, or the owner proves to be boring... B3 will make something interesting up, which can be problematic later on. Sure. But at least it's not like completely useless. Providing perfect cartography and, and record keeping is super useful. The problem is the record keeping might be somewhat embellished. Only if it was boring. That's true. Now, should the owner venture into a city or a town, Brambleton's Bard book will spawn 1d6 books, magically depositing them in random places throughout the city. So it just kind of, you know ports them into, say, the nearby bookshop or sure. a set of scrolls or, I don't know, in somebody's, you know, laundry. To the orphanage. Yeah, to the orphanage, wherever they are, right? These books are all non-magical and contain the current lore and story of the owner. And now you understand why this could be problematic. Sure. Because if it's embellishing you, oh, you defeated the last dragon? <laughs> How interesting. He's in town now. And now they, they want you to kill the next dragon. Right. Yeah, that could go very poorly. I mean, it's really designed to kill characters if sure. you do it improperly. Or properly, it depends on how you look at that. <laughs> What's the lore on this? Brambleton was a legendary bard, a cad, and a troublemaker who suffered from a severe case of imposter syndrome. Okay. Like many people do. Sure. Never believing he was good enough, he hid these emotions from the public and only confided them in his memoirs, often talking to the book while he wrote in it. So he was writing in the book. He's talking to the book, right? Sure. Talking about his thoughts, kind of working them out into the book. The book over time absorbed these qualities and sought the very things Brambleton sought, which was namely fame and recognition. Makes sense. So I love this idea that basically this bard was actually a really good bard, but thought he was terrible and feared never making a name for himself or recognition and his emotions caused the object to become intelligent. He imprinted his negative emotions on the book yeah it's like a warehouse 13 sort of so that's brambleton's bard book just a ridiculous piece of literary fiction <laughs> right literally literary yeah fiction. i was gonna say <laughs> speaking of other types of fictions we have what tonight and we've got the question of the week okay what is the question of the week this week well it starts off tragically oh no you have died i've died yep okay your spirit has escaped into an object near you. Hmm. What is it, and what powers do you offer? I am going to say that my spirit, being the type of spirit that it is, infests a crown roll bag. Sure. Full of dice. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm given. A, 
a purple Crown Royal bag. Traditional. Yes, of course. Very traditional. Purple and gold, right? Yep. Very nice looking Crown Royal bag as well. Uh, and I will say it's power. Uh, it makes caltrips, specifically lots of dice. Sure. I would say it has ever flowing dice. And if you're being particularly nasty, or maybe it just recognizes it's always this. Always D4s. It's always D4s. Sure. Right? Yeah. Metal dice. Think about that. That would be hilarious, right? And then once per week, maybe gift someone with the perfect set of dice. That's nice. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm I, sometimes nice. I was going to say, both of us would love to be able to do that, to just be like, I was thinking of you. Here's the and perfect it just set be of, the perfect set of dice for that person. That would be dice awesome. I've always wanted. Yep. Oh my God, this amethyst set of dice is just amazing. Or this is the color of magic, right? Sure. It's purple and pink, folks. So there, that's it. That's all it would do, right? Ever flowing dice. Drown somebody in dice. Make dice t- caltrips. I don't know. Sure. If anybody else has another use for dice, let me know. The bottom three foot of a 20 foot pit trap is nothing but D4s. That would be nasty. So awful. Yeah. I have a terrible brain for thinking that up. So I have an idea of what yours might be, but I'm curious if I'm on the money. Okay. Is it booze related? It is somewhat booze related. Okay. Yes. It's not the coffee cup though. Oh. Yeah. It's a black backpack. How traditional of you. <laughs> Indeed. It basically is going to act as a robe of useful items. And once per day, you're going to be able to pull a bottle of quality booze out of one of the side pockets. This I approve of. That's very much you. It's my Dragon Con bag. Yeah, no, absolutely. (laughs) If anybody's ever seen Matt at Dragon Con, he always has useful items in his backpack that he carries around all through Con. And there's always at least one quality bottle of booze in the side pockets. Yeah. Every time. That's awesome. We're interested in what you might happen to be if you would suddenly die and your spirit infested an object. What is it? Hit us up at Goblin's Corner on Twitter. And of course, you can see us on all the other social media channels as well. Absolutely. There's a lot of them. So I'm not many. Even, I'm not even counting. <laughs> okay, we've got four more delightful magic items. Indeed. So tell me of the next intelligent object. This is called the Hallowed Gravestone. Yeah, we're just going to stay on the somebody died theme. Okay, cool. <laughs> that, I didn't intend to put it like that, but it just happened yeah, to work out. We're in a out. morbid case yeah. here. It's fine. Let's, let's see what we got. The description is a black marble gravestone with a stained glass insert of a holy symbol. Appropriate to your game. Yeah. That sounds great. Okay, so we've got this black marble gravestone. Very mm-hmm. ominous. Could be. Could be. Could just be stylish. Okay, so it's a stylish yeah. gravestone. The personality is a little different than some of the other ones. These gravestones contain the spirit of a grave cleric whose job it is to protect important graveyards. And as such, each gravestone has the personality of that priest. Okay, so there's different ones yes. that you're thinking of. So this is just like a specific one for a cleric. Yep. Okay. And it doesn't even have to be a cleric. It just has to be a priest of a deity that you know protects graveyards yeah like the raven queen kalimvor whatever your right deity happens to be in your game there's a lot of different ones pathfinder deities sure the powers are projection mm-hmm. so literally it can ghostly walk out of its gravestone and just chat with people oh it comes out like obi-wan luke exactly yeah it's kind of it's a force ghost yeah just get force ghost just kind of <laughs> Sits down, has a cup of tea with you. That's always fun. Yep. It can speak with spirits. So basically, you can talk to it about, you know, your your great-grandmother. Or, you know, my aunt had the best recipe for apple pie. Can you ask her what it was? (laughs) It has the ability to geese. Now, here's my theory behind that. Now we're getting into some weirdness here. If you ask for something from the spirit and the spirit asks for something back like if it has unfinished business or whatever the priest will keys you to do whatever the spirit asked for okay it's a trade you get what you are asking for but now you have to do the thing so you better want that information badly because you might be doing some side quests exactly all right i mean that's a fair trade i think it can animate a grave golem particularly nasty if you guys don't know what that is imagine a big stone golem made of grave dirt and 
cemetery slabs. Yep. It's nasty times, right? And the great thing about grave golems is when they dissipate, they literally just lay back down to exactly how they were. They do not dis- disrupt the graveyard. They can also summon a pack of church grims. Now, what is a church grim? Okay. So, once upon a time, they used to bury dogs in graveyards as the first creature that was buried there because it was believed that the first thing buried in the graveyard, it was that thing's job to protect the graveyard forever. Okay. And so they would bury the dogs and the spirits of the dogs would protect the graveyard. This priest can summon a pack of ghost dogs, those ghost dogs, baying ghost dogs and tear you asunder. Indeed. Oh yeah. I love that. (laughs) You know, necromancers are going to have a bad day when that happens. It's thick. You imagine this necromancer comes rolling up. Igor is behind him. They're like, "Yes, we're, it's time to make our flesh golems." You know, Una, Una. All of a sudden, a pack of what is that? A, is that a bunch of basset hounds? What's going on here? And they just go for the throat. Exactly, just out of nowhere. Just, Aru! yeah, that'd be great. Now, some of these may be clerics and have clerical spells. The dogs? No. Oh, uh, some of the priests. Sorry, I should have specified. Badass dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. The puppies have clerical. The spells. The puppies have clerical spells. That'd be great. Also, destroying a hallowed gravestone places a mark of anathema on you that is visible only to the faithful of religions that create them. Mm-hmm. Regardless of whether or not that priest was of their particular faith, so any faith that creates them sees you as marked as anathema. So if there are six different religions that makes them, you're anathema to all of them. So any faith that creates these types of gravestones, they're like, that guy knocked over a gravestone. Yep. Uh, that's You're not going to, yeah, let's go fill some diplomacy checks on that one, my friend. <laughs> Let me tell you. So what's the lore behind this thing? These gravestones have existed in some form or another for nearly as long as the idea of graveyards. In ancient times, elderly priests would dedicate a new graveyard by carving their own gravestone and in a ceremony dedicated to the protection of these sacred grounds, bury themselves beneath it. Yeah, not morbid at all. Nope. We're going on a happy note here. (laughs) These days, priests volunteer to be tied to the stones after their deaths. Probably best. (laughs) It's not unusual for adventuring clerics to volunteer for this duty as it allows them to continue their friendships after their deaths. And now a lot of priesthoods will trade out this duty after a certain amount of time to allow priests that did volunteer to eventually move to their final reward. This is kind of cool. I I could see this in terms of like a side quest or maybe like a side story where your characters are maybe visiting a dead relative and this, again, like Obi-Wan with the robe and stuff, you know? Yeah. Comes, comes just kind of striding out behind one of the one of the mortuary stones or, uh, what is it, um, the mausoleums. Yeah. Just kind of rolls around past the mausoleum. is like, hello there. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> exactly. I also feel like it would be a cool way to offer old knowledge. Right, because how long has this priest been dead? How long has this graveyard been here? It'd be a great NPC. Yeah. Just saying. What a great way to do knowledge checks, like you said, or to, again, add more lore to your game world. Maybe you're making this game from scratch, and the characters don't know anything about this. It's a good way to interject some stuff. To go by the gravestone, go bury something. Dude pops up. What's going on? Have you guys heard about this, the story of blah, blah, blah? Oh, that? Yeah. That's I hadn't heard about that. He tells you the story. Next thing you know, you're on an adventure. They may know very interesting and old thing. I'm dead and I know things. <laughs> he's dead and he's loving it, guys. Keep making dead jokes. Cool. Next, we have the wheel of the nameless captain. Yes, and it is a captain's wheel. Okay. Like, you know. Like a, and for an actual ship. For an actual ship that you would steer. Okay. You know the punchline for the joke is going to come at some point, right? It's driving me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Everybody else is thinking it online too. 
Sure. So the description is as follows. This rugged teak ship's wheel constantly oozes a fine line of salty brine from the various cracks in the wood. The handles of the ship's wheel are polished smooth from the many hands which have used it over the years, and wherever the wheel turns up, a light breeze can be felt. It's a ship's wheel. Sure. Happens to evoke briny imagery and such. What's the personality of this thing? It's a gruff captain. (laughs) The wheel of the nameless captain is generally gruff, practical, and no nonsense when it comes to sailing the open water. However, during times of gentle breezes, it will often break into songs, generally filthy and badly sung. Sailor's ballads, so to speak. The wheel has an overriding drive to be reunited with the original ship and welder and constantly seeks any lore it can find on the legendary nameless captain. It's got to be difficult. Yeah, because it's a nameless captain. Sure. You don't know who it is, right? To that end, whenever someone is not at the wheel of whatever vessel it's attached to, it will steer in the direction it thinks the nameless captain happens to be, or where it thinks it can find lore on the nameless captain. So you could be floating along in the open waters, and someone takes a break, maybe they drop anchor, and it's like <laughs> that. Pulls the anchor up, starts steering the vessel. Oh, so it can it can animate bits of the ship then? Yes, it can. Oh, okay. Not many, but I would say anything that pertains to like moving the ship. A small sail in the anchor? Mm-hmm. Just enough, right? Sure. I love it. Speaking of powers, the wheel of the nameless captain can attach itself to any floating vessel and resize itself according to the user. So sure. if you're floating in a dinghy or you're in a galleon, it can fit that. Or if you're a halfling or a goliath. Yes, yeah, if you're, if you're halfling, it's tiny. If you're a goliath, it's a big-ass wheel. Sure. Additionally, once fitted onto a boat or a water vessel, it can magically propel the vehicle across the water, regardless of whether it is currently able to. So, for example... If the sails are gone. Yeah, or maybe there's a hole in the boat and it's capsized. Oh, nice. So it will literally steer whatever floats. That's super good if you lose your rudder, because it'll still steer. Well, imagine, like, say you your ship has been attacked by a kraken. You're on the open water, on the driftwood, like whatever's left. You've you just made yourself, slap the, you just slap slap that the guy wheel on, on it. Yeah, you call it a day, right? <laughs> just surfing across the water <laughs> on a little slab of wood. I love it. That would be awesome, right? Or I was thinking like- It's like know, the Jack Sparrow, like the ship is sinking as you come into port. I'm thinking like the Castaway Island rafts they make off the piece, like the square yeah. piece of, of raft that they've built off the boat. And they've got like that one sail that's made of all of the sailors' clothes that, are, sure. that have survived. And they see this wheel just floating in the open waters and they just grab it. This is cool. And it's like, ah, attach me to the main mass sailor. Yep. And they slap it up and it just takes off. We be going to find the nameless captain now. And they're like- well, I mean, not, it's moving. It's moving. Yeah, we running. don't care where it goes now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's its powers, right? Yeah. What is the lore behind this? Obviously, there's a nameless captain. Yes. But. So long ago, a legendary captain whose name is now lost to history amassed a treasure large enough to make the very gods envious. Okay. A, a lot of a lot of loot, right? Yeah. One particular deity of the ocean coveted the great wealth and then tricked the nameless captain into sailing into a magical storm which destroyed the ship and sent the captain and crew to a watery grave. Like you do. Like you do. Only the ship's wheel was left, riding the currents to its fate. Whether that captain was a saint or a pirate will never be known, but what is known is that somewhere deep in the waters of a far-off realm is a treasure and adventure of a lifetime. It's true, but there's enough of a treasure there for the gods to strike you down if you get it, is it worth going to get? I don't it depends know. Depends on what level you are, right? True. But I think that I'm thinking like a Clash of the Titans style game, right? I'm thinking that like you now treat the treasure as a bank. You just go and get what you need as you need it. If you could find it. You make withdraw. No, I'm talking about after you've found it. Oh, after you found it. Yeah. Instead of collecting all of it and invoking the wrath of the gods, you're like well, we really just need some new weapons you and know a new what I boat. Would do? Just... I, I would melt it all down into one lump sum and then stick the ship's wheel to it and pilot it. <laughs> nice. That's, Good call. That's what you do. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the wheel of the nameless captain. Now you knew we were going to have to do this at some point. We've come across some intelligent footwear. Yes. And I love this because I haven't seen any intelligent shoes lately <laughs> in any game. I've 
I don't think I've ever seen them. Well, you we are about to dis, we are about to show them at this point. Indeed. So Matt, talk to me about the motley treads. All right. These oversized, brightly colored cloth jester shoes each have a gigantic bell on the end of the shoe with a different face. So each bell has a different face? Yes. Do the bells talk? Yes. That is awesome. <laughs> I just I'm thinking for some reason my brain goes directly to labyrinth with the knockers. Mhm. Like the door knockers, kind of like that type of face, like the gargoyle looking face, or it could be just a humanoid jester face. But because they're like these big brightly colored bells, are they like brass bells? Or yeah. gold? Oh yeah, yeah. No, they're brass. They're brass? Yeah. Okay. Cool. What's the personality of the Motley Treads? Now, each bell is a separate personality, but they both love to travel. They love practical jokes. They constantly talk in a good-natured way. Okay. The thing is, the user must travel. So they force the user to travel, so yes. to speak. If the user remains in one place for too long, the shoes will kidnap him by sleepwalking to the next town. This has a lot of fun implications behind it. <laughs> you know, you fall asleep, the shoes look at each other, hop on your feet, and... Take your body for a walk. You know, that actually might be useful just in the very nature of things. Maybe I don't feel like traveling too much. I don't. I can't do this forced march. And so I go to sleep and the shoes get bored and they're like, you know what? The next town's only 10 miles away. You wake up in the next town. Wake up exhausted. Well. <laughs> With a level of exhaustion. Just like, wait, where am I? How did I? Oh, I slept, but I bed. don't feel, yeah, I slept, <laughs> but I don't feel rested for some reason. Cool. All right, talk to me about these powers. All right. Aside from making people walk. First off, they don't wear out. Useful if you have a pair of magical shoes. Yeah. They allow you to use expeditious retreat, mm -hmm. which doesn't have to be used for retreating. They also can cast vicious mockery. Yeah, I can see that. They're gesture shoes. Yeah, they're, they're smart asses. The shoes can make themselves invisible. Only the shoes? Yes, they make themselves invisible. So it looks like you're wearing socks. Once per month, you can teleport if you're imprisoned against your will. Where does it go? Wherever you need to go. Oh, so it's a random location. Yep. Nice. You go not in prison. Oh, I That's see. That's where you go. I get locked up accidentally. Which is also why they can make themselves invisible. Because they don't like being locked up. Well, no. So that the guards don't know that you're wearing magical shoes. Oh, I see. Very useful. Yes. Although they might question why you're wearing nothing but socks. Hey, they came and got you. It's true. What's the lore on these shoes? The souls of two traveling comedians, lifelong rivals and friends. Due to a misunderstanding with some nobility, they were once imprisoned for years until their death. Only the constant contact with each other kept them sane. And then they became two souls, exactly, so to speak. The two souls became two souls. Yep. I love it. I see them as kind of like Statler and Waldorf. Absolutely. With a little less mean-spirited, but yes. Just kind of hanging from their from their chains in the prison until they died, and then they became the shoes. Yeah, they, they're all hung up, and now they're hung up as the little bobble bells on the end of the jester shoes. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of sway back, back and forth and talk, crack jokes. Talk smack to the people wearing them. Yeah. And to people who are around. They were comedians. They talk smack to anyone. I want someone to use these in their game, and I want them to tell us about it. Because I think this is prime comedic value in any game. I agree. So those are the Motley Treads, huh? They feel, uh, they feel like a lot of fun to me. Yeah. Well, we've got one more item. It's true. Tell me about the Porcelain Toad of Maramuthru. Yes. This is our final intelligent object for this evening. So this is, in terms of description-wise, this is a fine porcelain toad. Okay. So like the kind you see in people's gardens, right? Little little umbrella or the one with the little fishing rod and reel. You know, I would say maybe it might change over time. Sure. I like I like all. Yeah. What if it predicts the weather, right? So it's got an umbrella up, or if it's about to rain. It's got the umbrella. If it's already raining, it's on a lily pad. I like it. That it would be hilarious. Yeah. So this is just a finely crafted porcelain toad, okay. which supposedly contains the ashes of a giant awakened toad. 
It's a big old Mr. Toad. So it's a toad to toad. It's a toad to toad. Yes. What is the personality of the toad? Well, it's a toad. Okay. So <laughs> it acts like an intelligent toad, which it is. It has a fondness for top hats, wild rides, and fine foods. Okay. Everybody loves Mr. Toad's wild ride. Mm-hmm. The, <laughs> the porcelain toad of Maramuthru compels the owner to sample new food and experiences. Okay. Which could be good or for bad. Sure. As a toad, it is lewd and will often try to assist its owner in any potential romantic endeavors. It's a horny toad. Aha. The toad can mimic its owner's voice. <laughs> okay, so it's a problematic toad. It's a very problematic toad, yes. What powers does this thing have? Polymorph toad once per day if you kiss it. So once per day, you can turn into a toad. Okay. Right? You gain a prehensile tongue attack with a range of 15 feet. This is whether you're a toad or not. Uh, you have the ability to hold your breath a number of hours equal to your constitution modifier. Nice. Okay. So you, you get toad-like abilities, so to speak. You can long jump 20 feet, high jump 10 feet. That's nice. Yeah. It's pretty good, right? Yep. The toad itself has a hardness of 5 and 15 hit points to it because it's porcelain. Sure. So it will break. If the toad is broken, it reforms somewhere else in the world in 1d4 days. Nice. So you got to watch out. If you smash it, it's gone. Yeah. But it reforms someplace else to bother someone else. That's great. It is not perfect for every game. It's perfect for my game. But, but for the correct game, it could be a lot of fun. I would also approve if instead of an awakened toad, it would be a slod. Tell us about the lore of this. Mara Muthru was a druid of some renown in the realms, particularly for her entourage of awakened animals, and most notably, her giant toad friend. Okay. When her friend died, she then cremated his ashes and put it into an exquisitely crafted porcelain toad, which she made herself. The toad retains those qualities to this day. That's it. Yeah. It's a giant awakened toad. The spirit of the toad resides and causes you to do lewd and froggy things. Sure. And if anybody doesn't understand why it's lewd, you've not spent much time around frogs. Or toads. Or toads. Yeah. Amphibians yeah. in general, really. Yeah. They're freaky. Now, one of the things we did discuss about this when we were talking about doing this episode was doing some weapons but making them unusual. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think we discussed was a kleptomaniac great axe. Yes. And a menacing sling, like a sling that provides fear effects. I think it should just intimidate people. Just, the, in and of itself, the, the sling, sling does? should just intimidate. Yeah, like constantly talk to the enemy. I'm going to hit you with that rock. You ready for this rock? It's going to hurt real bad when you get hit. That halfling there, he's a sharpshooter. 150 miles an hour of stone, baby. Yeah, it should, <laughs> it should talk like Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's what it needs to do. <laughs> nice. That would be hilarious. The kleptomaniac axe, I have no idea what to do with that, but it's just fun. It, just, to, it seems fun. It seems That's fun. All. It's a giant weapon that likes to steal things. Yes. So there you have it. Several magic objects which are intelligent for you to use in your campaign. I dare say these are not only amusing, but also full of delightful lore. Yeah. We'd love to hear you use them. Yeah, drop I'm going to use them. <laughs> <laughs> it amuses us. It's true. Any questions or comments, hit us up at Goblin's Corner on Twitter. Do you enjoy our show? We've got a whole bunch more. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player, YouTube, and Twitch. Click the five stars. Give us a review on iTunes and Podchaser. And on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe buttons. It gets our show in front of more people. It boosts the show and feeds the hungry algorithm. Which is currently a very large, intelligent axe, which is about to steal all of the stuff out of your pockets. Huh. I felt for sure you were going to go with the toad, but I'm good with the axe. Yeah. I'm trying to keep you on your toes. <laughs> Toads. Nice. That's all the time we have for tonight. Once again, my name is Eric. And I'm Matt. We'll see you next time. Good night, folks. The Goblin's Corner has been written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. D20 did our music. And this is, in fact, a subterranean production. Your voice is so low. <laughs> Bump the boop da ba, bump the boop da ba.